Here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that Pete Doherty has more top 40 hits than Julian Casablanca's? It's true. With the Libertines, he had six, and with Baby Shambles, he had five. Meanwhile, the Strokes have eight, and the Voids have zero. Ah, but let's not forget Pete Doherty also had the number one single that he wrote for Wolfman. With 12 top 40 hits and a bona fide claim to being an influential figure in UK indie music, I don't think that Pete Doherty gets enough dues. Did you also know that Pete Doherty was one of the first people to start leaking his own music to the internet, going behind his record label's back and giving studio sessions straight to the fans? But all that is nothing compared to the big breakfast that he ate one time. He ate four fried eggs, four rashes of bacon, four sausages, a quarter pound of beef burger, hash browns, mushrooms, chips, onion rings, bubble and squeak, beans and tomatoes, and two slices of specifically thick bread. The story broke locally at first, but quickly went viral, being featured in many publications. But the most important one is maybe my favourite piece of vice journalism ever. In Alan McGee's autobiography, Creation Stories, he talks about his time managing the Libertines, and on the topic of Pete Doherty, he says this. Pete Sober would be the biggest rock and roll star in the world, but he's the most nihilistic man I've ever met, and in the end, I didn't know how to reach him. I don't think we're ever going to find out how great he could have been. In order to understand the Libertines' music, I wanted to go to the pit that Pete was in, but I wasn't prepared to try heroin, even ironically. But there was another thing that I could do. Hi, um... I was planning a, a trip to Margate recently, and I was wondering if you still do the Big Breakfast Challenge? Yeah, we're doing it. Perfect, okay, that's great. You see, not only does Margate have the Dolby Cafe home of the Mega Breakfast, it also has the Albion Rooms, a boutique hotel owned by the band The Libertines. And as well as the hotel, there's an attached bar open to the public, and a music studio that you can book. You won't find Pete Doherty there these days though, as he was banned for doing too many drugs and bringing other crack friends over. So I wanted to go to Margate, stay at the Libertines Hotel, eat the Pete Doherty big breakfast, and maybe, along the way, learn something about the many bootlegs and the varied career of Pete Doherty. Because in the history of popular music, there is an established canon. Great records and known legends. That's fine, but we can do better. Let me take you to a world of boots and also legs. I'll be telling the stories of the fake and the leaked, exploring stolen tapes and lost recordings. It's a moral dark zone, but in it are some of music's most fascinating stories. And today, I'm looking at the misunderstood king of British indie. Pete Doherty. The Libertines was formed by Pete Doherty and Carl Barrett. Carl was dating Pete's sister, and Pete looked up to Carl because he could play guitar, and Pete pestered Carl to form a band. They attended university in London for a little while before dropping out and squatting around. They spent quite a long time just having rotating members and playing gigs in pubs before, in 2002, they signed to Rough Trade. Their debut single, What A Waster, entered the top 40 charts and got them a cover on NME. Rough Trade had signed the Libertines for 50 grand. Pete and Carl split 40 of that, and it's at this point that crack cocaine starts to enter the picture. Normally, you can get to Margate via the train from London, but the weekend that I'd booked the hotel, the rail strikes were on. So, last minute, we decided to rent a car and have a little road trip to where Pete Doherty's hotel stands today. You can't stand me now, you can't stand me now, you can't stand me now.
stand me now, you can't 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 stand me now, This is some real bargain. <laughs> it had been a long car journey to get to Margate, but we were anxious to see what the Albion Rooms Hotel had in store for us. This is a mega tour arena. After checking in at the bar, we were given the keys to our room, so up we went to see what awaited us. Emily We can definitely fit through on that bed. Oh, this is this is cute. And we've got a little balcony that we can throw Ed off of. To really be, to really get in the spirit of being Pete Doherty. Cambridge graduate Mark Blanco lies dying in the street as Pete Doherty runs off, followed by his minder, Johnny Headlock. What en suite. Fuck? What? What's that? If you open this book, yeah. there's an old Motorola. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you fellas right now, this is kinda lovely. It is pretty sick. What are your initial thoughts? Honestly, really cool. Got a, they got a big but yeah. head book thing. Head book thing sick, hundred club stories, typewriter. More head thing, cards. Then we headed to the bar to have a couple of swift drinks. Yeah. In the morning, I felt refreshed after sleeping on the comfortable mattress and I felt ready to take on the day's challenge. I can't wait to eat this breakfast. I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok. <laughs> <laughs> We're here at the Dolby Cafe, best breakfast in Kent, to see what it's all about. So let's peep that vibe, let's do that again. Upon entering the Dolby Cafe, I saw the Wall of Fame, and on it, Pete Doherty's name was spelt wrong. And once I was at the cafe, there was nothing left for me to do but to face the big breakfast challenge. Oh my god. Alright. <laughs> the breakfast is a lot bigger than it seems in pictures. And I was intimidated, to yeah, say the okay, least. This is yeah. that, is, that is literally twice the size of my arm. You're going to underestimate it. Right, you've got 20 minutes. I'll let you know when you've got 10 minutes and you've got 5 minutes. Alright, do I get a 3 2 1 or something? Oh. Three, two, one, <laughs> Cheers. When I was growing up in the UK in the 2000s and 2010s, there were two different things that were both called indie that referred to two slightly different concepts. There was indie like this. Oh, come and there was indie like this. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm 17. And I'm an indie. If you said you were into indie, the predominant assumption was stuff like Arctic Monkeys, Viola Beach, Palmer Violets, not Talking Heads, Grandaddy, or like Swell Maps. This particular breed of UK indie 
comes about immediately post the demise of Britpop. So let's take a look at what happens in music history there. Every music journalist instantly shits themselves and decides that the Strokes are going to be the next big thing. Across the Atlantic in the UK, there's an instant scramble to find the UK's answer to the Strokes. There's a little band called the Libertines, and their manager says that they can get signed to Rough Trade if they change their sound to sound more like the Strokes. Previously, they had sounded like this. Everyone knows the baby's unhappy Another day in paradise Then, they sounded like this. Julian Casablancas told the producer of Is This It that he wanted it to sound like your favourite pair of blue jeans, worn in and comfortable. The Libertines to me though, they sound so much edgier and sharper. It's like iron that you find at a junkyard that's like been twisted and punctured and you don't want to touch it because it might give you tetanus. <laughs> And this high energy version of The Strokes proved to be very influential. I just wanted to be one of The Strokes. No, Alex. You wanted to be a libertine. Fat. It's gonna be the pub and squeak that fucks you. <laughs> it's just oodles of it. You could, you could grow a plant in that. It's like mulch. <laughs> Here's something that I don't think Pete Doherty gets nearly enough credit for. These days, the zeitgeist is for bands and artists to post early snippets works in progress, and other behind-the-scenes content to TikTok. Even big artists signed to major labels do this. Pete Doherty was active on the Libertines forums, just chatting with fans. But he would also just dump MP3s. He released the French Sessions, Legs 11, Baby Shambles Sessions. And he wasn't leaking just anything. These were whole songs that were going to be on future albums that weren't released yet. Here's a fun fact that appeals to probably only me. The username on the Libertines forums that he used was Heavy Horse, and a lot of people assumed this was a reference to heroin, but it was actually the name of a Smith's bootleg LP that he owned. Fellow bootleg appreciator, I see you, Pete. Bootlegging his own shit and also taking on a pseudonym of a bootleg. That's just cool. Anyway, the point of me bringing this up is that Pete Doherty was well ahead of the curve of using the internet to break down the barrier between artist and fan, and his record label fucking hated him for it. Pete was dumping whole recording sessions as MP3s, including new and never-before-heard songs. This means the label was totally shafted. 
He was even organizing gigs himself on the fan forums, completely cutting out the circuit of promoters, venues, and industry men. I'm not one of your fans, I'm not one of your neighbors, and I'm sick of your bloody noise, just like all the other neighbors around here. Such was Pete's lack of respect for his record label. He would put out a seven inch with some French guys that wanted to do something with him, and when they couldn't fit all of the songs onto the wax, he just dumped those sessions online as well. A few years after Pete does this, bands like Black Kids and Arctic Monkeys would start uploading EPs to MySpace and use momentum from that in order to get signed to a label. After that, record labels would begin poaching musicians from YouTube. Initially acts like Justin Bieber and later Alicia Cara were signed this way. What we would come to see is the record labels regaining control of the internet music ecosystem. The industry uses the internet as another tool for profit and control. Odd Future, PC Music and Death Grips have all done cool things with internet distribution, but I really think that Pete Doherty deserves credit for imagining an alternative path entirely. Total freedom for music, the destruction of the entire music industry ecosystem, all the way back in 2004. And he also had a YouTube channel where he uploaded videos with Amy Winehouse where they're both on drugs and playing with baby mice. No, I'm the dumb one. Who should I have a baby? Oh. Oh my god, that's quite psychedelic. For the rest of them. I just think there's about 30. These ones I don't mean to take. I'm. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life. This is the dawning of, of a new, new mouse life. And while I'm talking about Amy Winehouse, that brings me to another point. Don't you think it's fucked up that the media, while she was alive, was so harsh towards her, and then as soon as she died, only then does she get the accolades that she deserves? It's really grotesque. And I think this relates to Pete Doherty because he he never died, he remained this thing for the media to gawk at. It's grotesque. I'm not saying that Pete Doherty should have died. I'm saying that he shouldn't have to die in order to get recognition. We shouldn't wait until artists die to give them love and recognition for the great work that they've contributed. I don't think it's right. And it's one of the things that I want to set right with this video, that I don't think Pete Doherty's legacy right now is in alignment with what he's contributed to music. However, I do believe that there is one major contributing factor that has led to his legacy being diminished um, from his heyday. Pete Doherty suffered from his addiction to drugs, and as a result of that addiction, he did a lot of bad things. and. People can forgive a lot of bad things in the music industry as long as you've got tunes. But stuff like burglarizing your bandmates flat and consistently missing gigs, look at the dates on these articles. Screwing over record labels is funny. It's punk rock, it's cool. But screwing over your friends is less funny and that's ultimately what broke up the Libertines. And screwing over your fans is a surefire way to tarnish your own legacy. And because of his addiction, he ended up screwing over his fans. Okay, that's most of the heavy stuff out of the way now. Let's go back to the big breakfast in Kent. How am I getting on with that? I'm feeling very sweaty now. That's good, it's your body getting rid of the uh, bubbles. I'm hitting the wall. I'm really hitting the wall now, boys. Take the hat off. Let the food leave your head scalp. <laughs> this is like that you're, bit. You're a bit <laughs> you know, like in anime, where like the hero is like basically defeated, and then like he's just like he's like, this isn't my final form. Yeah, this is like man, absolute lowest. 
Matt's phone is currently just on there. Time is up. Whoa. But if you finish it, we can submit it and then we'll have a Okay, okay. Editor's note. It was not okay, okay. Point five is needed. Yeah. Uh... Can you, uh... Move your plate to see how much you get. Yeah, sure. Push it all on one side. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, and that's also flatter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, also, there's a piece of bread, 60%. It's the, it's the bubble and squeak. I tell you, it's the bubble and squeak. As I sat there, unable to go any further, I reflected on what I could have done differently and pondered the value of any of this. Do you think this is nutritionally balanced? Uh, no. While I didn't finish the breakfast, returning to Pete Doherty, I think he might yet still have a happy ending. Despite his long-running battle with addiction and time out of the spotlight, he has recently been making somewhat of a comeback. One resource I used while working on this video was Pete's autobiography, which came out recently. Amusingly, he's done a bunch of interviews saying it was all ghostwritten and distancing himself from it. So it's nice to see that he's still fucking over people who are handling his releases. According to a recent Guardian profile, he's gotten sober and he even made an appearance on the British panel show Nevermind the Buzzcocks. Something's emerging from the past. I can see a hotel corridor and kittens, but nothing else. Maybe. <laughs> Where'd, where'd you get the kittens, Pete? From a cat. Where'd you think? <laughs> he put out an album last year with one of his other bands, which had one song on it that I liked a lot. You know what I want. You know what I need. You can't keep it from me forever. There's something powerful about a recovered addict singing about having his wants kept from him. Pete Doherty has always written a good chorus, and despite being a non-entity in the hype cycles of the current year, I don't think that he's entirely spent yet. He'll go on, he'll go on, he'll go on, he'll go on. Forever. I go on, I go on, I go on, I go on, I get too involved. I've gone forever. Thank you for watching this video through to the end, and a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. I make fuck all off of these videos because of all the copyrighted music I use, so if you want to support the channel, as well as subscribing and commenting, uh, feel free to check out the Patreon. I've started posting um, miscellaneous music writing there, so if you want to check that out, um, it's only a, a couple of pounds. And again, thank you very much for watching. You see the sign? It's in frame. No parking. 24 access required. 24 access? 24 takes at this fucking line. <laughs> One time Alex Turner went to go and visit Pete Doherty when he was in the studio, but Pete Doherty didn't know who Alex Turner was, and he said to him, unless you're here to give me crack, fuck off. <laughs>